important campaign uh, launched by the mayor to elevate the issue of domestic workers in the city of Chicago and really Chicago land area. We've done tonight's presentation uh, really with an eye toward presenting it to workers. So it's a workers' rights presentation. I mean, Fox, I'm with the Office of Labor Standards. We've got our partner here, uh, Michelle Villegas from the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and we will get started. We probably won't take a full hour, but we'll see how we do. So just framing the issue, um, employers, when you think of like who hires domestic workers, uh, employers of domestic workers and the workers themselves often lack awareness of the basic labor protections. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go off camera if no one objects. Um, <clears throat> employers of domestic workers and the workers themselves lack awareness of the labor protections mandated by the law. If you, for example, just think of all the kind of people that come into your home, if you've got a contractor, if you've got someone walking your dogs, if someone is taking care of your dad or mother, if someone is taking care of your kids for a period of time. And the city of Chicago should support and protect care economy workers. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the care economy. And we're gonna to try to present some of the rights that should be afforded um, workers in the city of Chicago under applicable ordinances. So the campaign we're working on now is called Your Home is Someone's Workplace. They just elevate this idea, bring it to the employers, maybe some of the people that aren't traditionally um, considering themselves employers, um, raise awareness, get them to think about best practices, and where applicable, enforce the rights of domestic workers. So give people resources so they understand how to access um, help, who to call, how to call, if they don't feel comfortable calling government, what are some local area worker centers or other resources they can access to get help in this process? And in the end, we need to build community trust um, because given the numbers we're gonna go through, it's clear that we need to establish trust within this worker community um, to get more cases. And we wanna expand the safety net for domestic workers. So tonight, this is our agenda. We've got quick introductions. We'll go through some data and statistics, talk about some of the definitions so people understand kind of what is a domestic worker in Illinois, what is a domestic worker under the Municipal Code of Chicago, and how does that apply, uh, and then talk about this campaign we've been working on. And we'll end with a little bit of timeline, and we'll have a resource page for those that are interested. So my name is Andy Fox. I work at the Office of Labor Standards, which is in the Department of the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. On the business side, we do licenses. Uh, you know, just think of all the businesses that have licenses, um, Uber, Lyft, taxis, and investigations. So there are a lot of consumer protections on the side. I'm over the uh, protection of workers in the area of minimum wage, paid sick leave, uh, the anti-retaliation ordinance, and the last one is the Fair Work Week ordinance. And I'll introduce Michelle Villegas. Thanks, Andy. I'm Michelle Villegas. I am the state and local campaigns manager with National Domestic Workers Alliance, and so I've worked with uh, a lot of different state and local entities across the country that are trying to implement policy or programs uh, related to domestic workers. And I also work with um, the Illinois Domestic Workers Coalition in all of the you know, work that they do, both legislative and um, more service driven. So uh, it's exciting to be here. And um, I think this is a great project that should model for a lot of other cities across the country. Thank you. So, I'm going to check the slides in pink. Michelle will do the ones that are kind of, it's an off blue. I will do. So, this one is for Michelle. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yep. So, just starting off with a little bit of data, um, as we can see here, the breakdown of domestic workers um, in relation to 
you know, all other workers in the Chicago sort of area. Um, we're looking at domestic workers as a pretty small percentage of the overall workforce. And I think that's important to, uh, to highlight. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little while, but from those, from that percentage of domestic workers that we're able to track and have data on, uh, we have the breakdown of house cleaners and nannies, um, you know, care providers in one's home, and then ones that are agency-based and non-agency-based. And so I think it's important to, to see a few things in the data. Um, from domestic workers, a lot of them are agency-based, and we see a lot of employers uh, going through an agency to hire any sort of domestic worker in their home. And so where it used to be a much more employer-employee specific relationship, we're seeing agencies sort of playing the middleman a, a lot. And so that can be good and it can be bad, and we'll kind of dive into that a little bit um, as we get into some of the slides, but it's still important to acknowledge that whether you're going through an agency or you're not going through an agency, you are still the employer of the domestic worker in your home um, when they come to work every day, right? So, or every time they come to work. Um, it's also interesting to see here that we have care providers oftentimes um, get sort of forgotten in the domestic worker sort of like when folks think about who they're employing, um, but they actually make up a pretty large percentage of folks that are domestic workers. Um, and so while house cleaners and nannies obviously are sort of the more traditional folks that we think of as employers that we're hiring, looking to hire in our home, um, care providers make, make up a large percentage of them. And especially in a COVID time, um, are off, we're often the most essential uh, workers for a family uh, during COVID. And so obviously thinking about the set of priorities or um, you know, things that are necessary became really important in the last few months. So we also put up some minimum wage data with an eye toward just, high, I mean, right now in Chicago, the minimum wage for domestic workers is at a minimum 1350 per hour, unless of course they work for an agency and there, there are more than 21 employer employees at an agency where they work, it would be $14 an hour, but clearly the median wage is below that of the minimum wage. Um, so it's of concern. It's something that given this data through May 2019 and July 29, I'm sorry, in July 20, I'm sorry, July 1, 2020, <clears throat> the minimum wage increased to 1350. So if people are making this kind of wage, they call 311 or they initiate a complaint or they reach out to someone who could help them uh, fill out a complaint form or just call us, we could take that claim and help them get at least the minimum wage. Uh, child care workers, median wage as of May 2019, we're at 1143. Home health and personal care, 1236. Maids, housekeeping, cleaners, we're at approximately median wage of 1276. And if you look at the income levels, it's um, painfully low to sustain a family on. Yeah, and, and so to go off of, of that a little bit, you know, NDWA does national surveys uh, pretty often of our membership of domestic workers. And so based on, on those surveys, we've um, seen that domestic workers oftentimes really don't have access to the kind of employer provider benefits that are available to workers in, in many other industries. And oftentimes even the benefits that they might have through state or local agencies are hard for them to navigate or they don't have that information. Um, so that's part of um, the importance of this project. But just some basics, um, about 65% of the membership that were in the survey lacked health insurance. Um, about 82% did not have access to paid sick leave. 
uh, about 4% reported that their employer contributed to a worker's compensation and um, fewer than 2% received retirement or pension benefits and less than 9% had employers paying into a social security fund. So, you know, these sort of very essential benefits that uh, we think about as benefits that are included in a good, a good job um, or a sustainable job uh, are not something that we're seeing a lot of our domestic workers um, having access to. And so even to go further during the COVID crisis, I think we saw just an even more devastating scenario for domestic workers across the country, including those in Chicago. Um, you know, we saw just devastating underemployment um, or just total unemployment. In a survey that we conducted in early April, we saw that 72% of workers reported having no job um, and 70% reported that they were unsure if their employees would hire them back after COVID. Um, so as you see, you know, a lot of us experienced uncertainties through the COVID crisis, but I think for domestic workers, that shift of, you know, having to quickly shift into having no employment um, or in not being sure that you're going to have employment at all, um, you know, in when or how many months, I think is very stressful. 84% um, of them reported that they weren't sure if they would be able to afford food for their families. 55% um, were unable to pay April's rent, and then 77% were worried about eviction. And so obviously those were conversations that we were having in April um, and that can, those numbers continued to get even more you know, dire uh, as the COVID months went on. Um, and so one of the things that we started to think about, especially as the COVID pandemic continued on for longer and longer periods of time is that we knew that we, we had an opportunity to ensure that as Chicago is reopening and recovering from, from this period of time that we're able to support our domestic workers and their families. So we know that they've had this really difficult period of time to unemployment. Some may have experienced eviction. Uh, and so as the city is reopening, we want to encourage people to hire their domestic workers back. But we want to make sure that everybody's being safe uh, and that domestic workers are being uh, you know, compensated fairly and they're being respected uh, and taken into account as we're safely doing this reopening. Well, the numbers are staggering. You know, I was, you know, commenting to a different group of people about how few cases we've gotten. When you look at the numbers that were laid off, I just wonder, is that a great percentage of the population is not working at all or working in some other field, um, they're not in a position to call and complain because they're just simply not employed. Um, so we'll see how the recovery goes. So the campaign we started was really to kind of put a spotlight on this issue. Um, the mayor's mother did domestic work, so she's very uh, keen to the issue, very close to her heart. Um, she's very uh, involved in what we're doing and would like to see us succeed. You know, I have gone through it myself during when we kicked off the campaign, the first video we cut, I kind of had to like recut the video because I was bursting into tears. My own father has uh, taken on like 24 hour care. Um, he's a lot better now, but at that time, we weren't sure what we were gonna do. And so we're for domestic workers in his home, caring for him, helping him move around. Um, I don't know what we would have done. It's just that critical of work. And they were all African, they still are, all African-American women that are caring for him. Uh, and it really hits home when you live it. So the campaign really serves as a call to action. We're trying to get domestic workers uh, attention in four areas, get them a, 
uh, fair living wage. So domestic workers are in tier two at a minimum of the minimum wage ordinance. They're moving toward parity with the rest of the minimum wage uh, tiers. Uh, I, I think that's something, you know, other employers under four don't have to get paid the minimum wage. So the mayor said we need to escalate and at least pay them more, pay them close to a living wage. We need to get them paid time off. We need to have written expectations communicated to the workers through the employers. Um, and, you know, it's a safe workplace this is the fourth tier. That really refers to workplace harassment, sexual harassment, just kind of workplace violence. A workplace should be safe. A domestic workers shouldn't have to come to work and face um, harassment of the different kinds of um, that that exist. Yeah. So here we have um, just a quick outline of the different entities that are holding pieces of this campaign. Uh, and so the mayor's office is the lead on this project. They're really uh, the entity that is designing and implementing uh, these guidelines and then obviously use it, utilizing their social media platforms and connections to disseminate information. So that's part of what we're doing here tonight, but also, you know, as the mayor's office with the sort of like weight that the mayor's office holds, uh, they're using that to spread information that will be helpful to both employers and domestic workers. Um, the Office of Labor Standards is, you know, providing webinars, outreach, again, to both employers and workers, um, but also helping in some of that enforcement piece, which is so essential and crucial to the success of this campaign, which is, you know, helping to conduct investigations um, of employers who violate the rights of domestic workers. Um, there's the National Domestic Workers Alliance, uh, which provides expertise and guidance on subject matter, uh, you know, connecting the city to networks of employers and workers that we have built relationships with for a long time. and help do other work with. So, you know, the Illinois Domestic Workers Alliance, all of our partners uh, and worker centers across the city who are really sort of the champions of this work. Um, so making sure that, that, camp that the campaign includes all of those folks on the ground. Um, so obviously the community-based organizations, which is really the meat and bones of the movement. And uh, they are not only providing the subject matter expertise, but also they're the ones who are really assisting in bringing together workers, um, domestic workers, their input participation, really making sure their voices are being heard and uh, elevated in this campaign. Um, and then also providing the support to workers who will oftentimes go to one of these community-based organizations because these, these organizations have built the trust in those communities for workers to have a space uh, in which they could come and bring a complaint um, or, you know, answer questions directly with domestic workers. So it's, it's obviously, it's, it's a huge part of what we're doing here. Sorry, I didn't mean to advance the slide before you were finished. <laughs> oh. So, you know, we've, We've kind of listed out some of the areas we'd like to focus. Um, and this is an evolving bullet list. <laughs> We've got our website that is really a hub for information uh, where people can come in and kind of view the resources that the mayor's office put together and some of the partners we're going to be working with, working on public service announcements. Uh, I was walking today uh, downtown, and then right next to a bus, bus stop, there was one of those digital billboards, and it's listing. It's got the your home is someone's workplace uh, images from the campaign pop up and direct you to the website. We've been trying to do outreach via email, but, you know, reaching employers is one thing. 
finding employers who are not using agencies is a challenge. So we're going to have to do some more outreach. We're probably going to have to lean on partners. We're going to have to use different networks. We have to be very creative. And that would lead us to areas such as social media content. We probably need to put together kind of a round table of ideas with some different people uh, who work in this area to think about where where are the employers of domestic workers at? Are they at Whole Foods on the weekend? Are they at church on the weekend? You know, how do we get our message to them? Do they have little hubs of activity? Like, is there a website where they go and seek information? Um, we're gonna have to be creative. So, you know, these webinars are good, but I think the outreach is gonna have to take on a different level and approach as we move forward. We've also created some really wonderful flyers and posters. Um, the mayor's office was really good at kind of figuring out if we were to put up a flyer, we can't have it so dense with information that someone walking by with a child they're caring for, a nanny, for example, would have to like take a bunch of notes and figure out how to launch it and get onto a website. You know, what is the basic information we can put up for people to digest? and reach us. Um, we do, we've set a goal of having a couple high profile fireside chats with, um, let's call them uh, uh, leadership level people who could really escalate the issue. We're hoping to identify certain leaders in the domestic worker movement and or elected officials to sit and just kind of walk us through these issues in their eyes. and and attract uh, more numbers. So the working group we set up um, convenes federal, state, and local government agencies with community-based organizations, individuals with lived experience to address exploitation and trafficking happening across industry. So rather than do a top-down, set the agenda, here's what we do, we put together a working group and the goal is that through the group, through consensus, through ideas, through trust building, we get groups who work in these industries to identify high-risk industries ripe, rife with, or for, it probably should be rife with an FE, rife with exploitation and or trafficking. The first industry we're looking at is domestic work. And in that, we could develop strategies, um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost it, such as new or revised regulations and or ordinances that increase protection to support individuals who've experienced exploitation and or trafficking, develop strategies, and build upon the ones that already exist to ensure businesses know they're required to do under the law. And, you know, private employment agencies, you know, those entities that hire domestic workers and farm them out to the, are, are one tier of it. It's also the, the families people, individuals who are hiring people to do services and work in their home that meet the definition of domestic work, we need to reach them and develop a cross-agency partnership because as we set up the kind of this hub for information, we realized it involves the Department of Labor because they have the PEAs. It involves the Department of Public Health. There's some licensing possibly through Department of Children and Family Services. There are more entities involved than just the city of Chicago. So we've really got to dig in to some of our cross-agency partnerships to increase coordination on cases and increase our ability to hold bad actors accountable. So the working group as a goal will recommend policy solutions. And even in our first meeting, we saw some really great ideas, create formal partnerships between intergovernmental agencies. So for example, the Office of Labor Standards would cut an agreement with the Department of Labor to share information. Right now, we're not able to share certain confidential information between agencies, so explore ways that agencies could refer cases to other entities, or if we don't have the power to do it, we could refer it somewhere else, and create formal partnerships between government and community-based organizations. And that, that is really the future of our success would be 
getting involved with the CBOs and finding ways to partner with them uh, to bring in more cases. Yes, so the, you know, the, the key rights of domestic workers or care workers that we're enforcing um, and hope, hoping that we um, not just enforce for that domestic workers feel like they can come and, uh, you know, file claims, um, but also that employers will have awareness of uh, these key rights and make sure that they're implementing them in their own you know, homes and, and in their own employee contracts or whatever, however they're um, working to employ their uh, a, a domestic worker. So uh, the first is um, minimum wage, and we talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, paid sick leave is one that it, we're really blessed to have in the city of Chicago, uh, but obviously want to make sure that uh, we we are people are aware that they have this um, one day rest in seven, which I know we'll dive into in the next few slides. Overtime, right to a break, um, so making sure that you're you know fitting those within the right time frames. Um, freedom from sexual harassment and freedom from discrimination, which are two really essential pieces of the awareness and and you know the narrative especially for domestic workers who are oftentimes part of communities that are more vulnerable or sensitive. That's a really good point. See, you know, I, I, we take for granted that paid sick leave exists. It doesn't exist at a state level. Mm -hmm. So at some point we probably need to advocate at a state level that the state bring in paid sick leave. And the issue of sufficient paid sick leave was addressed recently. People right now, the minimum requirement only gives people one week of paid sick leave. In COVID, we've seen that if you have to quarantine for 14 days and you have banked, you know, a week of days, five days yeah. saved, 40 hours, that second week you might not be paid. So, you know, these are areas that make sense and are the right thing to do. We should be exploring those uh, for these important workers. So this is a little technical, but just to remind people, uh, if you're doing work as a housekeeper, a house cleaner, if you're doing home management, if you're doing nanny services, including child care and child monitoring, if you're providing care, personal care, home health services for elderly persons, persons with an injury, illness, disability who require assistance in caring for themselves, you meet the definition of domestic work. If you're doing laundry, cooking, if you're doing companion services, if you're chauffeuring people around, um, uh, it meets the definition of domestic work. Other household services for members of households or their guests in or about a private home or residence or any other location where domestic work is performed. That's really a catch-all for some other work that's done in and around the home. I mean, a domestic worker means a person employed to perform domestic work. So are you a domestic worker? You look to this, if you see one to 10, you're doing domestic work uh, in the city. Well, that's from the Illinois Domestic Worker Bills of Rights, Workers Bill of Rights. So I'm not gonna read through all of this. But the Illinois statute says domestic work does not include the following things. So there is, there are limitations to what domestic worker is. Uh, if you're the parent, spouse, child, or other member of the immediate family, not a domestic worker. If you're at a child and daycare home provider participating in the child care assistance program under section such and such under the Illinois Public Aid, Aid Code, not domestic work. There are a few others. I don't need to read through them all, but there are some exceptions to what domestic work is. Uh, but, you know, I'll, we'll make this available at, at a later time for you to read. But just so you know, it's not, there are some exceptions. Now, when we're in the city of Chicago, we, we all, and we are, if we're in, in my world, it's all about jurisdiction. 
So I've got to figure out, do we have an employee? Um, and do we have a covered employee? So under the Chicago minimum wage ordinance, some of the claims we get are involved minimum wage. So I thought, let's just go to the definition of an employee. It means an individual that performs work for an employer in the capacity of an employee as distinguished from a contractor, determined pursuant to Illinois Revenue Service guidelines. Interestingly, after some recent research, there used to be a dichotomy. That, and, and really, for independent contractors who have a 1099, those would not meet the definition of an employee under the Municipal Code of Chicago. However, if you have a W-2, you could be an employee. If we have an undocumented worker or someone who doesn't have a W-2, doesn't have a 1099, is receiving cash payment, and they have all the indicia of an employee, they might meet the definition of an employee. So if a person is a is an independent contractor, they would not be an employee to be an independent contractor. And that's just the way the IRS treats them. However, if there's no indicia of either W-2, 1099, for example, an undocumented worker, then the Office of Labor Standards could look at what, what the indicia of the work is uh, and run through it and determine that someone was an employee. So if a person is performing work for an employee, an employer in the capacity of an employee, they might meet the definition of employee, excluding independent contractors. I know that was kind of convoluted, but so the definition of a covered employee does not include an individual permitted to work for A, an employer who has fewer than four employees. So that's the exclusion. If an employer has less than four employees, they're not covered employees. They are not entitled to the minimum wage with the exception. And this is where the mayor leaned in and said, all domestic workers, including domestic workers employed by employers with fewer than four shall be covered employees if the individual meets the other requirements. So if you work in a home and there's only you there, and you're an, uh, an employee, you could be a covered employee entitled to the minimum wage. If there are two of you at the home, if there are three of you at the home, you could still get the minimum wage at 1350, which is generally the minimum wage for employers who have from four to 20 employees. So here's a chart, I don't need to dwell on it too long, and it just kind of spells out the minimum wage requirements and the overtime requirements. So for small employers, including domestic workers, the minimum wage effective July 1st, 1350. The overtime wage effective July 1st, 2020 was 2025. Uh, domestic workers, I don't know that they're tipped domestic workers, so we don't need to talk about that. Now paid sick leave. If you work for someone, the number of employees doesn't matter. Employers must provide employees, I know those are, because it's a capital E, it's a term of art, employees with paid sick leave to care for themselves or a family member if they work at least 80 hours within any 120 day period. So how do they earn leave? People earn leave every 40 hours work you earn one hour. So if you work 20 weeks at 40 hours a week, that's 20 hours. If you work 40 weeks at 40 hours a week, that's 40 hours. And that's, that's the minimum you should earn. Um, employers can allow for more, but they have to allow for one hour of paid sick leave for every 40 hours worked using leave up to 60 hours in a 12-month period when the employer family member is ill, injured, or a victim of domestic violence or sex offense, or for medical care, treatment, diagnosis, or preventative care, among other reasons. Now, this up to 60 hours in a 12-month period uh, also involves the Family Medical Leave Act, but people can use leave. So if you get sick, if you're taking care of a family member, if your child gets sick and you have to help them, you know, they're out of school, then you can use leave. Carry over, so there's really three concepts, earning leave, using leave, carry over. Carry over means 
a person, a worker, carries over one half of paid sick leave hours between a 12-month period. So if the calendar year for the employer is July 1st through June 30, uh, on June 30, if they have 30 hours, they can carry over 15 of those. They would start the year with 15 hours and continue to earn up to 40 and use them as they needed to. So the work, the one day in seven uh, from the one day rest in seven act um, is just as its name implies. It allows for at least 24 hours of rest in every calendar week. And a calendar week is defined as seven consecutive 24 hour periods um, starting basically at 12 a.m. on Sunday and ending at midnight the following Saturday. So under this act, employers um, can also ask for what is called an idle for a relaxation of this requirement. So, so if an idle grants a relaxation, it requires a statement from the employer demonstrating that all employees who will be working seven days in a row are in fact volunteering to work seven days in a row. Um, and so I think this is important because oftentimes we talk about domestic workers being employed by families or being care workers, um, being nannies. And so these are oftentimes job, oftentimes jobs that, you know, people where people want to be flexible and workers want to be flexible. And so I, I think it's important to remember that there's a process. Um, in how to, you know, go ahead and be flexible and do those things that sometimes, you know, are are outside of, you know, what this act is implying that an employer or enforcing rather than an employer should do. Um, the other piece of this uh, one day rest in seven act is that it provides um, for employees, a minimum of 24 hours of rest in each calendar week, so that's the, set, the one day per seven, and also a meal period of 20 minutes for every seven and a half hour shift. So um, that's really important to remember that if you have a, you know, I think most families are probably providing um, a break time for their domestic workers, but I think it's really crucial to remember if you have a care worker who you know, is staying overnight, if you have a nanny who does extended uh, weekends, you know, these different scenarios in our lives, which our domestic workers, you know, really do take on uh, a very personal job in our homes. It's really important to remember that as employers, they're still our employees and they have rights by law that we have to abide by and follow um, and make sure that we're providing space for domestic workers to be honest and communicate with us um, as our employees. Those are really important points. Um, um, <laughs> you know, it's almost like I, I hate to say it, but I think about my brother is managing my father's care, and I don't know if he's been given, like, here's a guide on some of what you might be doing correctly or incorrectly, or as different people rotate in and out of the house, like, here's how you greet them, here's where they sit. And in COVID-19, like, what are some additional protections that they should be taking that you should be taking? Mm -hmm. So these are areas I think that maybe the agencies think about, but in a state like my father's in Indiana, I don't know that there are nearly as many worker protections. So the goal here is in Chicago, we have uh, kind of the leadership and the vision and the support to do it right, um, unquestionably. So worker rights, domestic workers are due overtime pay. Uh, so if you're not getting overtime pay, 20, 25 an hour uh, at a minimum, then you should make a complaint or let your employer know and communicate. Um, it's that simple. Um, and I think Michelle touched on this and might just be a, some of the same information. I think these, the, this was a hot link probably to the Illinois Department of Labor's website regarding meal and breaks. They have got an FAQ index 
and I, I don't have a link here. Maybe I should just on the next time we do this, just put up uh, the actual name of the link. Um, and there's a typo in questions. <laughs> but um, B, who is to work seven and a half continuous hours or more, shall be, be provided a meal period of at least 20 minutes. Meal period must be given to an employee no later than five hours after beginning work. Illinois has no law regarding breaks. For more information, visit the ODRISA page. I think that can be found at the Illinois Department of Labor's website. Yeah, so uh, the last couple of uh, points that we're talking about today are, you know, sensitive, and I think everybody who is a worker wants to have the freedom from sexual harassment. But I think particular when, particularly when we are talking about domestic workers, it's it's especially important to understand the vulnerable positions that oftentimes care workers and um, nannies or you know other domestic workers are put in. And so it's really important that we take action and that we're not ignoring um, any sort of sexual misconduct that we may witness, whether it's within our home or within someone else's home. Um, we also, um, you know, just under the law, sexual harassment is prohibited by the city of Chicago. Uh, a sexual harassment victim can be of the opposite sex or the same sex as the harasser. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, acts that might be considered sexual harassment include repeated unwelcome sexually suggestive comments. They can be gestures. It can be emails, um, pictures. Uh, it can be verbal. Um, unwelcome physical contact of a, of a sexual nature um, oftentimes can be requests for sexual favors in exchange for employment benefit, such as a raise or a promotion, um, or a subtle or direct threat that a sexual or personal relationship is required for employment promotion or other favorable treatment in the workplace. You know, these are all straightforward um, in traditional workplaces. Um, and even then, oftentimes it can be difficult to um, confront, but I think particularly as an employer of a domestic worker, we should always be aware that the situation is even more um, difficult to navigate oftentimes, particularly for a domestic worker who is coming into your home um, who is put in a vulnerable position because of the nature of their work or uh, because of their background. And so I think particularly for domestic workers, it's important um, to understand that these scenarios um, may play out in a way that is different from our traditional workspaces. Those are really important comments. I was thinking about the I know that the hotel industry was required to put in like an emergency call system in the hotel for workers. Mm -hmm. And not that I'm advocating that something similar be in place, but you talked about how vulnerable workers are when they're in someone's home. And these, you, you just, it's a whole different dynamic. Um, so, oh, one more from Michelle. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, these are, you know, resources. Um, if you are the victim of sexual harassment or if you know somebody who is, definitely don't ignore it. Like I said, it's important that we acknowledge these things as they're happening in our own homes and our own lives, but also if you see it happening in someone else's home, um, a colleague or a friend, you know, I think it's still really important to speak up. And there are all kinds of guidelines um, and the resources for uh, these scenarios. Um, you know, there's hotlines. You could file a complaint with the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. Um, there's a phone number and a website for you to visit if that's the case. There's also a Facebook page um, and uh, an email at the City of Chicago. This is really important stuff. I feel like we should make it. Uh larger on the page for people, but I guess 
um, we could direct them to the website for more information. Um, with regarding discrimination, the Chicago Human Rights Ordinance prohibits discrimination in employment, public accommodations, credit transactions, bonding, as well as retaliation. The ordinance prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin, ancestry, religion, disability, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, parental status, marital status, military discharge status, source of income. So if you wish to file a complaint and pursue a discrimination claim at the Commission on Human Rights, if you believe you've been personally harmed by a violation of the Chicago Human Rights Ordinance, you can call 744-4111, 312-4111. And you don't have to reside in the city of Chicago to file a complaint, but the alleged discrimination must have occurred in Chicago. The commission must receive your complaint within 300 days of the incident for incidents of discrimination occurring on or after January 23, 2019. Again, 312-744-4111. Yeah, and so, I, you know, we talked a little bit about the uh, unique nature of domestic work and taking place in people's homes and just the acknowledgement that workers are more vulnerable to exploitation uh, and sometimes human trafficking, unfortunately. And so I think it's really important as employers to be aware that that there is a, a heightened level of risk um, for domestic workers um, for exploitation and in the last few years, NDWA has delved a little bit deeper into surveying and uh, conversations with domestic workers around human trafficking. And so there's certainly a level of awareness that we're trying to um, instill in the, in the workers community. But I think for employers, um, this is these are particularly enlightening um, a couple of slides because um, oftentimes there's a line that is blurry uh, between, you know, being a good employer and being, uh, you know, exploitative of your domestic worker. So, um, here are some common ways that traffickers or employers oftentimes exclude, exploit their workers and just as sort of like as a uh, overarching um, statement on human trafficking. Oftentimes, you know, it's, it may not be you as an employer that is being exploitative, but this can easily happen um, to other domestic workers that you might know, um, or even your own domestic worker who may be working in a different household who then, you know, tells you of some of this that might be happening to them. And so I think it's just really important for us to all know and be aware um, of what this could look like. Um, so essentially, um, human, tra human trafficking is the exploitation of human beings, and it is an individual who is compelled by force, fraud, or coercion um, for the purposes of commercial sex or forced labor um, is a victim of human trafficking. And I think the forced labor piece is one that oftentimes people don't associate with human trafficking, but I think it's really important um, in in a lot of domestic workers scenarios uh, to understand that, you know, there are laws against it. Um, common ways that traffickers or employers could exploit workers include threats of abuse or violence, threats to harm family, uh, physical or sexual abuse, restricted movement, um, constant supervision, change of promise job duties, lack of pay or being severely underpaid, threats of deportation, uh, withholding identification documents, um, and abusive labor conditions. Uh, and so just as an example, we were getting reports of domestic workers in another really large uh, American city uh, during the COVID-19 shutdown um, of domestic workers reporting that families who they were uh, nannies for had basically said, you know, you, ha you have to quarantine with us and 
Um, if you don't abide by these rules that we've set where you have to like be in our home 24 seven, you're not allowed to leave because they're afraid that they were going to get sick. Um, you know, if you don't comply with these uh, outline rules that we have for COVID, then, you know, we will report you or we will let, you know, other employers know that you're undocumented. And so it doesn't take too much to kind of cross that line into um, something that can be considered uh, human trafficking. And it's important for all of us to know these things so that we can help protect our domestic workers. Um, and our, you know, our worker friends, our other other employers who may not necessarily wish harm, but can cross the line. Um, so if you need help leaving your situation um, or meeting your basic needs, or if you want to speak to an attorney, uh, the National Human Trafficking Hotline is a good place to start. Um, you could call, text, or live chat any of these resources, um, and I think it's also this would be a great place to include some of the NDWA guidelines that we are publishing for COVID uh, and how best to interact, um, you know, as employers and workers to have those difficult conversations around how to keep uh, our families safe and also follow all of the labor standards. Um, it's really disturbing that case and those cases. Um, yeah. So if you have any questions, you could post them to the chat. You can put them in the questions and answers. I don't see any questions yet, but I'm open to that. If you have any, would like to email us any questions, comments, or insights, you could email us at BACP Labor Standards at cityofchicago.org. This is probably one in a series of events. Uh, expect a little more. Um, we might be reaching people in different venues going forward. So I hope that you know while the crowd today is small, we can expand the voice. Or if you're listening to this at some future time, uh, please check back on the uh, Chicago.gov forward slash CARES website where we would post things through the city's portal. Um, does anybody have any questions before we move to final comments? I haven't seen any questions yet, so I'm not imagining there will be, but I'll be monitoring that. I'd like to thank Michelle for being here with us. Thank you, Michelle. I learned a lot from your comments and your vision and your kind of thank understanding you. of the issues of domestic workers. Um, I, I, I'm really compelled to do more, so I guess that is what this is. We've launched this campaign to learn more about it to partner with people, to dig in and, and kind of kick the tires of the, all these issues and then do something um, because, it, and, and to do something, it's not just the workers, it's not just the employers who need to get others involved and really make a change in this area. So, Michelle, would you like to say anything? Thanks, Andy. I really appreciate that. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you and with all of our partners in the city of Chicago who are doing all of the work on the ground to, you know, make sure that domestic workers are uh, getting a fair uh, chance at, you know, at earning a living and making sure that employers are complying with all of the different labor standards. Um, I think just as a final note, um, you know, it's really important to make sure that we're in our own lives. The more that we can do is talk to our friends, our neighbors, other parents um, who are employing domestic workers and try to shift the culture and narrative around uh, who is an employer for a domestic worker. And so the more that we can normalize um, talking amongst each other and, and saying out loud, um, that we are employers for all intents and purposes if we employ a domestic worker. I think that is a really important uh, point of this campaign. And I think we can all do our part to make sure that we're having those conversations with our friends, families, and neighbors. So true. Thank you for closing us out, Michelle. And thank you for your words of wisdom. Uh, we will uh, post this on 
the chicago.gov forward slash CARES website. So I don't know if it'll go up tomorrow, probably tomorrow or sometime soon after that. So thank you all for attending. Have a good evening. Good night, everybody.